Let's look at point defects or defects that occupy only one space in the lattice. So they have no dimension, they're not a line, they're not a volume or an area. Uh, it's just a single lattice position. Um, so let's take a look at that. And here we go, I've drawn in uh, already a simple lattice. Don't get too hung up on whether it's simple cubic or, or, or you know, face center cubic or something else. Uh, right now it's a cartoon depiction of some atoms and, and this, is, this is fine for our purposes. So what kind of an imperfection could you have here? Well, you could have, um, you could certainly have a different type of atom occupying a space in the lattice. You know, just like somebody's in a classroom, I say it's like a backpack or something fitting into the spaces between the seats. The lattice sites are the seats where the students sit. And then you put your backpack, because it's usually smaller than you, uh, between the seats, okay? So that could be a spot, and we've seen that in ionic structures, we would call that an interstitial. So this would be an interstitial, an interstitial um, impurity. Okay, interstitial impurity. Um, again, don't think when you hear impurity that it's bad. These are in fact designed in um, many times on purpose. So for example, uh, carbon in iron. Well, carbon is substantially smaller than iron, um, and it goes into these little spaces between the iron atoms in the lattice. Uh, what else could you have? Um, you could certainly have, say, well, you know, what would happen if I took one of these atoms and got rid of it, all right? So, and, and instead replaced it with something else that was, you know, similar in size, um, say, copper and nickel. They're both the same size, same crystal structure, and um, it, uh, so, it, you know, perhaps it occupied the, the same site in the lattice, okay? That would also be an, an, an impurity, color it in like this and everything, um, and I happened to draw one that was a little bit smaller than the impurity atom, but that would still be an impurity, but it's not in an interstitial site this time, it's now substituting. So we call that substitutional impurity. Okay, and that happens. Again, to go substitutional, they have to be about the same size, usually within about 10%, same size, same crystal structure, similar electronegativity, so they don't react and form an ionic uh, compound, for example. Um, it could, you could also have, as well, um, an impurity atom that was larger, say, um, and I could draw it over here, perhaps. Say you had an atom that was a bit bigger, okay, than the um, than the host atoms. You know, then you'd have a situation sort of like this, uh, where it's still in a, a, a lattice site, but it's now occupying more space. Now, something that's interesting about this and important, in fact, is that as a result of this atom being here you'll have some, the atoms around it moving a little bit away from their regular positions. So in this case here, I've drawn the arrows going in to show that the lattice is sort of collapsing in on that particular site, whereas if it was related to this uh, atom here, which perhaps I, I could have colored in, um, in a different color, just to show the, um, so I use this green color, and then you'll see the arrows that I'm, will, be, will, will uh, relate to that particular color. So the green arrows here now are showing that, well, this atom, it's substitutional, but it's bigger than the host atoms. So it's going to displace the surrounding atoms, uh, the nearest neighbor atoms, and some beyond that, away from the um, equilibrium position. So in either case, though, there is what we would refer to as lattice strain. Okay, lattice strain. <coughs> strain. Okay, or residual strain. Um, <coughs> there's a bit of strain energy in the lattice. Uh, as a result of this. And that's going to be important when we look at how this interacts with dislocations. <clears throat> so, the other thing that we could see is you may have situations where the atom is just missing altogether. Okay, like this. And just for clarity, I'll remove these bonds. And there's a lattice site with no atom. Okay, and that is as well a type of impurity uh, or a point defect. It's an imperfection, I mean, and that's called a vacancy. There's a vacant atom site. Okay, so that's a vacancy. So these are all different types of point defects. Now, the vacancy in particular, we could spend a moment on, is 
um, <clears throat> thermally uh, generated, there's always going to be some of those. And in fact, the number of vacancies is a function of the temperature. So we could take, say, if we took the ratio of the number of vacancies to the number of lattice sites, it's um, as is the case for. Um, for, for any thermally activated process, it has this form here, E to the minus some activation energy over the product of the Boltzmann's constant and the absolute temperature. Okay, So that is an important equation that governs vacancy populations. And let me identify what each of these terms are. This is the energy required to form the vacancy. Okay, this is the Boltzmann constant. And this is the temperature in Kelvin. Okay, and, and so V is the number of vacancies. So I'd like to think of this as a competition between the binding energy, that is the energy that's holding the atom in the lattice, uh, and the thermal energy, that's, uh, that's what that product, uh, um, uh, sorry, that, uh, the, um, ex this, this term in the exponential represents. We've got the binding energy up top, or the energy to form the vacancy, and uh, in the denominator, the uh, thermal energy, essentially. And it's a competition between the two, and uh, atoms are bouncing around trying to make um, successful jumps out of the last, and every once in a while they make a successful jump. So the atom doesn't disappear altogether, but it moves to some other lattice site, perhaps a self-interstitial or somewhere else, or a free surface or an interface in the lattice. Um, all right, so the other thing I wanted to do, I, I promised you, is I would um, look at how these, how these atoms interact with, um, with dislocations. You know, it is a way of explaining mechanical behavior. So I'm just give myself a bit of space there. And so what I've drawn here now is a uh, little dislocation that you're familiar with from the previous video. And what I'm going to do is say, you know, what if we introduce now an interstitial atom, like we discussed just above? Well, you know that's going to push these atoms apart like this, create some lattice strain. It occupies a bit of space in the lattice. <clears throat> and there's also, though, associated with this, vac with this dislocation, there's also some strain energy. So this extra half plane of atoms, these two atoms here, have sort of occupied some space in the lattice and so they're, they're compressing the lattice here above the dislocation and below the lattice is in tension. So there's all this residual stress. So if you consider the situation that we've got here where there's an interstitial and there's a dislocation existing separately, you might be able to imagine that in fact if somehow the dislocation made its way over to the dislocation so that it existed here where there was already a little bit of space. It's like there's a little hole there almost. There's already a little bit of space for it. The total strain on the system or the total energy required for those two defects to exist together is less than for them to exist apart. And so in fact what we observe is that impurities um, tend to diffuse towards dislocations. Uh, so they diffuse towards dislocations to decrease the energy of the system. Now it's a random movement, but they're less likely to make us a jump, a successful jump away from the dislocation line once they've got there. Um, and that has some important implications in processing of some uh, steel alloys, um, where the dislocations are kind of pinned. The concept we can cover here, though, to do with mechanical deformation is that these the, the impurity atoms, they, they, they do, um, if you will, pin the dislocation there. That's a term that's often used, pin the dislocation. Okay, And that increases the strength because it makes it harder for that dislocation to move away from the impurity atom. Similarly, if we consider 
a dislocation coming across any of those other impurities that I discussed, like a substitutional impurity, the strain field surrounding the dislocation interacts with the strain field surrounding the impurity and the general statement we could make, which is accurate, is impurities tend to um, inhibit dislocation movement. And so it's for this reason that impurities um, strengthen material. So pure, a pure metal, uh, like pure gold for example, is really quite soft. And you add a little bit of silver, a little bit of copper to it, uh, and the strength significantly increases. Pure iron, another example, right? Not very industrially relevant to it. It's not very useful as an engineering material, but you add half a weight percent carbon, a tiny little bit of carbon that goes into interstitial sites and inhibits dislocation movement, the strength goes way up. Now it's a hugely important engineering material to us. All right, so um, imperfections are hugely important, and that was our look at point defects. Thanks.